Thank you. I apologize that you have to hear from me all three days and for a whole half an hour now, or right before lunch. So I'm going to keep you all trapped in here. Uh, so I apologize if I'm a little scattered. I've been running around for the conference. It's a little more, more work than I had uh, initially thought. But uh, let's go for it. So this is a quick about me. Um, that's my face and my name. Uh, you can basically find me everywhere on the internet with that tag, R-I-K-T-U-R-R, -R, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, website, email, anything, just put that and you'll probably find me. Um, so the bottom there is basically sums up my life. I say I'm a data scientist, it's on my business card, but uh, I'm really a data engineer in, you know, most of the time. And then a uh, PhD is kind of what I do on the weekends. Should be graduating in May, hopefully. So this basically is the inspiration for this talk. Uh, and you can see the title kind of comes from it. Well, OK, so that's not completely true. This was the inspiration for the thing that inspired my talk. And I'll show you that actually right now. Um, so basically, this is an interesting tweet by Gary Bernhardt. He's a dude who speaks a lot, basically, about programming. He gives lots of talks. He runs conferences and all that stuff. And this was really at the peak hype of big data. You look at this tweet, it was in 2015. So this is like peak, I need Hadoop, I have this big data, I need some NoSQL, uh, MapReduce, Spark, all of these things. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, I have big data, I need to do this stuff. Uh, and then he came out with this tweet that's like, well, you know, your data probably actually fits in RAM on a single machine. So um, that's what I'm going to convince you of today. And Probably make some people mad, but that's the point. And I'll have a very sarcastic tone for a lot of this, but that's also the point. So, uh, so let's click this. Oh, not that. Uh, let me go ahead and click this link. Oh, you get to see all my notes. Great. Uh, so this was the thing that I. Oops. Let's move this over there. Okay. So this was the thing that really inspired this talk. Uh, it's this little website somebody posted. And then it's like, interesting, OK, my data is 5 gigs. That makes sense. That fits in RAM, right? 50 gigs. OK, maybe not your laptop, but it fits in RAM somewhere. Uh, 500 gigs. OK, all right, that fits in RAM too. 5,000? OK, OK, that, that fits in RAM, right? 50,000? OK, maybe it doesn't now. But 5,000 gigs of RAM, that's 5 terabytes. There's a computer out there that has 5 terabytes of RAM and you could load your data into RAM. You don't need a cluster. And if you click this link, it just brings you to some big mainframe that costs lots of money, but technically fits in RAM. So that's the inspiration for this talk. Um, and mainly, I'm going to focus on machine learning research, data prep, and then model building for machine learning research, because I do machine learning research. So all of this is going to be very biased towards my own experiences, data sets that I've used, and just the experiences that I've had. So hopefully I can relay some of that information to you. Uh, also partially inspired by this talk uh, was this other talk that I saw by Eduardo Arino de la Rubia. At the time, he was the CEO and founder of Domino Data Lab. I think he's moved on uh, to something else since then. Uh, but this was at Strata in New York, I think in 2017. Completely different topic, was not talking about RAM or whatever. But he was talking about automated data science tools, which is a, actually a very fantastic talk if you want to go watch that. But because O'Reilly is dumb, you have to pay for it. So sorry. Um, anyway, uh, he gave this a random rant at the end. I think somebody asked a question about something. But basically, his rant was like, don't use Spark for machine learning. And I'm sorry for all of the data pricks and Spark people that are here. Uh, I love Spark. I'm a certified developer. I go to all the conferences. Spark has its place, and cluster computing has its place. It's very good and fantastic. But he was basically saying, don't use it for machine learning. And at the time, because I was a big Spark fanboy, I was like, what? This guy's, no, this guy doesn't make any sense. But then I started to do more things. I did some more research and found that, OK, maybe there is something to this. Maybe I can do all of my machine learning research on a single machine, but I'll do my data prep or whatever on a cluster. So again, before I make people too mad, I want to still say that cluster computing has its place. Uh, but maybe not now with NVIDIA Rapids. I don't know, that was a new thing for me. But cluster computing has, has a place, you know, big data. And there's a reason that this whole history of Hadoop and MapReduce and Spark and all this stuff happened, because it works, and it works really well. 
It helps you handle lots of data. It helps a lot with streaming data and all that good stuff. Um, so I'll start off with that before I make people too mad. So there's really two types of people here that I think I'm, I'm talking towards. Uh, we'll just say this half of the room are the data scientists, analysts, people who traditionally use your laptop or a single machine to do computing. And now you're running into um, data set size problems. Things are taking too long, right? The other side of this is our big data engineers, people who have been doing Hadoop and, and MapReduce and Spark for 10 years now, and I'm going to try to convince you that maybe you don't need to use those tools for everything. And these are the two things that I want you to take away, because you know, all the little details, may, you may forget it, or you can re reference the slides afterwards, but these are the two ideas I just want to give to you, like an inception style thing. Just take these ideas and plant them in your brain, and then do whatever you wish with, with them after that. First, the cloud is your friend. You want to use the cloud. It's very nice. And your laptop is stronger than you think. So you can do a lot more on your laptop than you probably think you can, and hopefully I can show you some tips and tricks to be able to do that. So let's get going. Uh, first, uh, the cloud is your friend, so use the cloud. Uh, for people who are not super familiar with the cloud, I'll breeze over this. Basically, there's not really a cloud. It's not this magical thing that's out there that gives you just like unlimited processing power or whatever. The cloud is somebody else's computer that they manage. They handle putting all the hardware together. They handle the power and all that stuff. You just say, hey, I want this machine for two hours. OK, they give you the machine, then you do stuff with it. But really, it's the same as your computer. Um, and uh, that's pretty much that. I, I love the sticker. It's in our, our cloud services and DevOps team, team's room. Uh, so real quick, here's a slide. You don't have to read all this. I'll highlight what you need to know. But I'm familiar with Amazon, so I'm just going to talk about Amazon. You know, Microsoft and Google also have very great cloud platforms. And these you know, ideas will transfer to those cloud platforms as well. This is just showing you there's some different types of instances that you can get from AWS, some that are built for computing, some that are built for memory, some that have GPUs, storage, anything you need. But what I want to show you is this right here. I know it's small, but I'm going to read it for you. Up to 768 gigabytes of memory per instance. So more likely than not, your data set is going to be smaller than 768 gigs of RAM, probably. So you can launch a machine and then do whatever you want to with that. Also, what if you're like, oh my gosh, I don't need RAM. I'm doing deep learning. I'm super cool. I get to look at images and all that stuff. Well, you also can get GPUs. Ah, GPUs. Yeah, sorry, NVIDIA. Uh, you don't have to buy their GPUs. You can just rent them. Of course, these aren't going to be like the top tier, like super fast thing that just came out yesterday that you have to pay $5,000 for. These are going to be a little bit older GPUs. But again, don't read this whole thing. What I want to show you, these two guys. You get a GPU, you get a CPUs, you get some RAM, 90 cents per hour. So if you're tinkering around, playing with something on the weekend, you only pay 90 cents per hour. You can actually get discounted rates from Amazon. Usually when I launch that machine, I pay like 30 cents per hour for it. So it's not bad. OK, so hopefully with these two slides, I've convinced you to use the cloud. The cloud is awesome. How do I do this thing? Well, I have another talk for you to watch. Um, this is a Git repo. Uh, I presented a talk about this probably around a year ago, actually, in this venue as well. Um, and this is just some helpers. Again, basically, this is a library I wrote for myself to do my research. Then I'm like, other people might be, find this helpful. Maybe they don't, but I'm posting it anyway. Uh, so this shows you a couple ways where you can just like get a Jupyter no notebook going in the cloud, SSH onto it, and then use it as if it was your own laptop. And if you want to grab a quick pic or whatever of that link, again, these slides will be posted later. Also, see, if you just use this little username, you'll find me anywhere. So you can find that on the internet. OK, moving along. So basically, I'm just going to have a bunch of slides with like four words on them, and then we're going to talk about it. First thing is use your libraries. Basically. Again, for this side of the room that already uses Python and R, they're the data scientists, analysts, more than likely than not, you have your favorite tools you like. You use scikit-learn, you use pandas, you use R, dplyr, all that good stuff. Use them. You're most effective with those tools. Go ahead and use them. Don't bother learning some complicated cluster computing thing that 
doesn't do everything that you need to. You're going to have to go into C or go into like some Scala code to actually write some custom stuff to do what you want. Use the libraries you already know, and then just get a machine with, oh, sorry about that. And then just get a machine with 500 gigs of RAM, and then you're off to the races. And, and the reason I say that is because cluster computing and cluster programming, distributed programming, is hard, right? It's all, you have to think about a lot of things. You have to think about different machines. Where do you send the memory? You know, are they all the same machine? Blah, 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 blah. When you have one computer, it's much easier to program on that. You have one computer. So here I want to show you, again, no offense to Spark. We got Spark on the left here. This is their entire library of machine learning. Fits on one page. This side is scikit-learn. And you see I have to scroll and make this little GIF thing because they have a ton of algorithms. Because scikit-learn is a dedicated machine learning library. Spark does a whole bunch of stuff, does a whole bunch of stuff really well, also does machine learning, and the machine learning is fine. They kind of base their API on the scikit-learn API anyway. Um, but you already have all this stuff. You're going to be limited over here. And uh, it's going to be more complicated. And then how do you transfer your models, blah, 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 blah. So if you already know scikit-learn, just keep using it. Just get a bigger machine. OK. But what if you're like, Aaron, no, you don't understand. I just have too much data. I have so much data. It's huge data. I need cluster computing. I couldn't possibly do that on a single machine. But, so what I'll say to that is, do you really need all the data, is, is what I'm saying. First of all, do you really have more than one terabyte of data? If you do, you're probably Facebook or NVIDIA, and you have your own tools to handle that. Those people, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to you at a, a you know, finance company. I'm talking to you at some you know, software company just trying to build some models, help your business do some cool things. You don't have more than a terabyte of data. Probably not. But OK. So big data revolution, all these people are like, yeah. All the data. More data means better models. We need more of it. We need more, 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 more. So then they're like, yeah, OK. Then now they finally convince the business. They're like, yes, we need more data. We need a cluster. We need to do this stuff. So then the business is like, go ahead. Use all that data. Build me a model with all of it. Then they turn into this guy. Because as soon as they try to do it, they're like, oh, all the data? That's kind of hard. Yeah, it is kind of hard, especially, again, when you're trying to program distributed machine learning algorithms. So basically, what I'm trying to say here is even if you have a lot of data, you probably don't need all of it for a machine learning algorithm. You probably can do a fancy thing called sampling. Yes. And statisticians have been doing this for years, sampling. More likely than not, you can sample your data. And again, you're a data scientist. You know all the fancy math to do that, to prove that only 10% of your data is needed to prove whatever you're trying to prove. So more likely than not, you can sample your data. And they, these are some like very cryptic graphs, because it's from some super top secret research that has not yet been published. So I had to obfuscate the axes. But basically what I'm showing here is on the x-axis is data set size. It's the same data set. You have some big data set first. We sample it down to different sizes. Uh, and it's backwards, sorry, so we're decreasing. So the smallest data set is over here. So on the left here, we have the AUC, which is the model performance. And so we can see these top two guys, OK, they stay pretty consistent. All the dots are pretty much within the error bars, so the models are essentially the same. Uh, and then this guy actually gets like way better as the data size gets smaller, which is very interesting. Here on the right side, we have the cost. And that goes, obviously, right, as soon as the data set size decreases, you need less time, you need less CPUs to actually do your computation. This cost is based on Amazon's pricing for, for different machines. Um, so yeah, basically, you reduce your cost, and you make your model better. Of course you're going to sample, because now you can try a bunch of different things. You're not stuck waiting days and days and days for an algorithm to finish running. Um, and especially in binary classification scenarios, it's really interesting, because I do uh, cancer risk prediction. That's what I do for my research. So most people are not going to get cancer. Small percentage of people will get cancer. So in my data set, it's less than 1% of people that are in the positive class, meaning they're high risk for cancer. So why do I need all 99% of that data? Just throw away randomly some of those instances, because more likely than not, 
people that don't get cancer, there will be groups of people that look very similar. And all you're doing is wasting CPU cycles by trying to build a model on all of those negative instances. Throw away half of them. Throw away 80% of them, something. Then you can run stuff a lot faster. Cool. All right. Uh, oh, this is just a blank slide for me to catch my breath, so. OK. Next, next one. File formats are very important. And this is something that I found a lot uh, at, at my company doing a lot of the data engineering work is that file formats are really, really crucial. And here are a couple examples of some file formats. On the left, we have our traditional kind of big file formats. And then here, we have our nicer file formats. So I'll walk through some of these. Database, right, it's a regular thing that you're going to get from any application, any kind of relational database. Um, and Excel, right? But none of us use Excel because we're good data scientists, right? We write code for everything. Nobody uses Excel here. Um, and then CSV files, it's the same thing. CSV files are just text. So when you have a bunch of text sitting on a file, it takes up way more space than it needs to. You take that text, you load it into RAM, it's taking up way more space than it needs to even in RAM. So it's not written on the slide here, but just remember this. You want a binary, columnar-oriented data format. And Wes will talk more about that tomorrow with Arrow. Uh, but that's really what you want. So binary, because you can compress that, data is going to be stored in a much more efficient manner. And you want columnar, because usually when you're doing data operations, you're operating on a whole column of records rather than each row individually. So also, Parquet is like my favorite thing ever, uh, because I found that Parquet files are much smaller, and they run faster. So Parquet is an Apache project. Uh, Spark supports this natively. A lot of uh, libraries support this. Pandas does now, thanks to Arrow. Um, basically, that is a columnar binary data format. It's a self-describing data format, which means the actual data files have the metadata in them, the column names and the column types. So now you're not dealing with the stupid stuff with CSVs where you're like, oh, what type is it? Is it a string? Is it an int? Is it whatever. Parquet handles that for you. Uh, Feather is a nice format also that came out of Arrow that helps you send data between different languages. It was more of like the initial prototype for Arrow. So like R and Python can read the same Feather file and get the same stuff. Uh, and HDF5 is a cool thing uh, that I won't talk about much. Just, just write these down and Google them later. That's really all this talk is for. So here's some uh, code real fast. I'm going to link to a notebook at the end too with this code. Um, but here's some random file that I made. It's not actually random. It's real data. But uh, this file, you know, just to do it on a laptop, 11 megabytes, right? I read this in. It's a tab delimited text file. And then write it out as a Parquet file. Didn't do anything to it. Didn't touch the data. Didn't, you know, sample it or anything. Same exact data now, 2.7 megabytes. So if you're bad at math, that's a five-fold increase. So uh, that helps a lot. And the compression might get better if you use different compression libraries and depending on what is inside of your data. So hopefully I proved to you that you can use Parquet now. Also, I don't have time to go into this, but HDF5 is a very handy file format. It's really good at like storing some metadata. Um, it's really good as well as uh, if you need to pull out specific uh, samples of your data, it'll actually index it and you can pull out samples really fast. I have a little gist here on GitHub Basically, I had an 80 gig CSV file, and I didn't want an 80 gig CSV file, so I wrote some code that will take that file, convert it to an HDF5 file. But my machine that I was using did not have 80 gigs, so what I had to do was take chunks of the CSV, continually append it to the HDF5, but then you get one big HDF5 file that I think ended up being like 10 or 20 gigabytes. So a little easier to manage, but just you know, some code right there. Next up, sparse matrices. So sparse matrices are cool uh, because they're, they're used a lot. Uh, again, this is just because what I encounter in my research, I deal with a lot of categorical data. So when you have categorical data, machines need to read numbers, not strings, uh, for machine learning. So um, I, you have to convert those. The easiest way is do one hot encoding. If you have 10 values that you're recording in a particular column, you create 10 new columns. And then for every row, only one of those columns will be 1 or not 0. But what happens when you do that is you get a lot of zeros, especially if you have thousands and thousands of different columns with hundreds of values in each. 
And what that creates is a sparse matrix. So a regular table, a regular matrix, rows and columns, you have numbers filled out through it, uh, is, is re recorded in a dense manner. Mathematically, a dense matrix is a matrix that has, or a sparse, mathematically, a sparse matrix has more zeros than non-zeros in it. But in computer terms, it's how you're storing the data. So a dense matrix will store every single value versus where a sparse matrix will only store the non-zero values. But what it does instead is it uh, stores an index value and then the actual value of your thing rather than every single value. And I'll show you how that helps. So again, here are some packages for you to write down in Google later if you don't know them. Uh, sparse matrices are very, very supported in Python. Uh, you can create them with SciPy. Pandas actually has a sparse data frame, which is really, really handy because you can actually assign column names and types to the, the sparse matrix, which is awesome. And scikit-learn, a bunch of the algorithms actually support sparse data. So just check out the documentation when you're building those models. Make sure it supports the sparse matrix, and then you're good to go. Uh, on the right side here are just a couple of the actual file formats that can actually materialize and persist uh, sparse uh, matrices to disk. These are actually text formats, but it's handy because, again, it'll store the index and then the actual value, index value, index value, whatever. Uh, LibSVM and ARFF, you can look that up. So here I will prove to you again what I'm saying. Here is some matrix. If you go through the notebook, it'll make sense completely you know, where all the stuff is coming from. But here's some big matrix, and you see most of the values are zeros. It's all zeros, right? We look at, look at the size of this. It's like 5,000 rows by 2,000 columns. Multiply that together it means you're recording, what is it, 12 million data points. And that's a pretty small data set. 5,000 samples, 2,000 columns, not very big. But you already have 12 million data points. But we'll use NumPy and check the non-zero values. We actually only have 56,000 actual real data points. So that means we're storing 12 million zeros for no reason. That's why we have sparse matrices. So here we use SciPy. Uh, and there's a sparse package inside SciPy. We're going to take our little dense matrix here. We're going to convert it to a sparse one. And it tells you, hey, you know, here's how big your matrix is, and here's how many values you have. And you can actually save it into NumPy native format, which is, again, a binary format for you to, to save data between NumPy. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm saving the original matrix, the dense one, here. And then I'll save the sparse one. And we can see, sorry if I'm not blocking it, our dense guy. 96 megabytes of zeros. They're all zeros. When you use a sparse one, 186 kilobytes. Same exact data. Your model is going to perform the same exact way, except you can leave work early. All right, next point. I might be running over time, but I'm the moderator, so I can take as much time as I want. Uh, next point. Your laptop is stronger than you think. So this is, again, for those people, oh, if you got a computer or whatever, and you want to do more stuff with it. Uh, what I find, too, a lot of the times that I'll do is I'll go back to that data sampling point, and I'll sample some data and then develop locally on my laptop. And then I'll deploy that same exact code to the cloud. And because I'm using a single machine and not a cluster, it's the same exact infrastructure. You have a Unix environment the same way you have a Unix environment on your laptop. And if you have a Windows environment on your laptop, throw out your laptop and get a Mac. Sorry. <laughs> my opinion only. OK, next point, use your cores. So your laptop probably has eight cores, or it should have at least eight cores. And if it doesn't, tell your boss you can't do your job properly, because you should have a decent computer. If you're working with data and you're doing things, you need to do your job. And if your boss won't get you the laptop, then maybe you're not working in the right place. Sorry. Um, so uh, but then if you're like, you know, I'm, try I'm new to this. I, you know, I'm trying to get into it. I don't actually have a job where I'm doing this. But Invest in a good laptop because, again, you want to try to save yourself some time. If you're waiting hours and hours for your jobs to finish, that's more and more time that you're going to waste just waiting for stuff um, where you could be moving on with your career and getting a new job. And you get a tax break or something. I think you can claim it, right? If we ever get a tax return this year, who knows? Um, so here are some packages. Again, these two I just added yesterday because I learned about them yesterday. Uh, Rapids doesn't even actually use your cores. It uses your GPU, but it goes along with the, the theme of what I'm saying. Um, top there is, is Python. Multiprocessing is just a regular multi-threading uh, library inside of Python. And then the bottom is some really handy R packages that you can look up later. 
cool success story for this, actually, at my company, we had this jo job that uh, basically it went through like every single patient in the data set and did some like super complex computations. And it was like dealing with longitudinal data and this and that. It took forever. It took like 12 hours to get for the job to run. And then what was happening is we would wait 12 hours and then we would figure out, oh, something's wrong. Let's run it again, 12 hours. Something's wrong again. Let's run it again. And then finally, I'm like, all right, enough of this. So I sat down a couple hours, used the multiprocessing package, and found out, wow, all you have to do is say, map this function, but instead of on one core, it runs on eight cores. And then, magically, it took 20 minutes. And that was amazing. And then everybody loved me and, and all that stuff. So uh, it was great. So user cores, multi-thread stuff. Some things can't be multi-threaded. Some things can really easily be multi-threaded. And you'll really be amazed at how much time you're going to save. Um, so now this is just a couple random tips to close out. There's nothing going to be technical now. Just, again, random ideas that I'm implanting in your brain. Uh, don't be patient is my motto. I am not a patient person. I don't like waiting for things to finish. If it takes longer than a minute, I'm like, oh, what's happening? This isn't right. So if it's taking too long, you should optimize it. And it's not because you, know, you can't wait 20 minutes, but what happens is if you wait 20 minutes for something, you're going to find a bug. You're going to have to wait 20 minutes again. And then you're going to bring it to your boss, and he's going to be like, ooh, can we do this and this and this? And then now it's going to take three hours because you added all this functionality to it. So don't be patient. If something takes a long time, you can probably optimize it. And if you can't optimize it on your computer, if you've multi-threaded it already, you can't do it, use the cloud. That's my first point. So time is money, right? And so there's always this trade-off. Because like, what if you're like, OK, well, the cloud, then I have to pay for that. I have to like rent something and deal with this and blah, 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 blah. But if $5 will send, save you a weekend of waiting for something, I think that's worth it. Because again, you can iterate on that faster. You can provide more value. And you can try more things, do some more cool science. Um, so that's my tip to you. Again, you, if you multi-threaded it, if you've done all these optimizations locally, it still is not very fast. Take that code throw it on the cloud, should run faster. And then my final tip for all of life, generally, is just use the internet. Somebody's probably done this before. Just Google it, or use Twitter, like, at somebody or, or something like that. So here's a review slide of everything we talked about, right? Starting off with, I do think cluster computing has a place, despite the title of the talk. That's just clickbait to get you in here. Um, the cloud is your friend. Use your cloud. But use your libraries. Use the things that you are familiar with, and you will be more successful because you already know how to use them. Uh, sample your data because you probably don't need all of it. Save in a binary columnar format. Use sparse matrices. Don't be saving zeros. It's not cool. And use your laptop. You can probably optimize things by multi-threading and uh, using different libraries and using the internet. So thank you, and that's a link for the code. Aaron, questions? Can you talk about differences in speed when you're running some machine learning algorithm when your data is in RAM on one computer, or in the other case, when your data is on a, a cluster and you're using some sort of distributed computing framework? How, how fast does the actual algorithm run in each case? Yeah, so what, what I've done in my own experience is um, I will just, so even if the data is stored on a cluster somewhere, a lot of times you'll take that and like throw it into S3, so basically taking it out of the cluster and then putting it into a single file, and then I'll pull it in to the uh, actual, you know, single machine. Um, but I haven't done any like head-to-head -head comparisons on like, let me run this exact algorithm on Spark and then run this exact algorithm like on Scikit. But what I have found, again, is more, it's more about the usability, I think, of it, where you can use a single machine and try a bunch of different stuff um, rather than having to deal with a cluster. I, I mean, I'm making all these claims. Again, I haven't run a head-to-head -head comparison. Probably you can go on the internet and find some things. But there might be scenarios where the cluster will actually could run it faster, especially when you think about something like a random forest, because then you can just basically put one tree on each node, and then that can multi-thread whatever processing it's doing in there. There are maybe scenarios where it's faster, but I think with multi-threading and using multiple cores, it essentially gives you the same 
it's the same feeling as having a cluster because you just have a job on each core instead. You'll need a lot more RAM because you're basically duplicating all your data across. But I don't have any exact numbers for you. A uh, question about sparse uh, usage. Um, at what point of sparsity um, is the threshold for um, clearly you're going to be saving memory the more sparse your, uh, your matrix is, but um, I've read that if you're at less than 95% uh, sparsity that it's um, slower computationally. Like there's a, there's a computation speed where even if your data is somewhat sparse, you would save memory, but it's slower than if it was dense. Do you have any, like, have any heuristic recommendation for at what level of sparsity percentage-wise for your data it makes sense to use sparse implementations? Yeah, so technically, mathematically, the cutoff would be 50%, right? Because if you have 50% zeros, then you would use that. In practice, it's probably more like 70, 80 that I've found, because again, it's the overhead and converting it back and forth, especially if you're using libraries or, or algorithms that don't support sparse data. So a lot of things like Keras or TensorFlow, for example, it has to have data in a dense format. So you're, you're paying for those conversions, right? You can store your data, and it's still really great that you can store, you don't have to store the zeros, it's smaller on disk, but then when you pull in chunks into memory, you still have to densify it. Um, but what I found just in general practice was around that 70, 80% were all stored in a sparse manner, because that's when it becomes cumbersome to do anything. But if it's somewhere like 50, 60, it's mostly dense anyway. Um, and again, if, and if it's dense, you do have more algorithms available to you. So scikit-learn, every single classifier supports dense data, only some of them supports sparse. So if you want to take a hit on the performance and just save it in a dense way, uh, and if that's doable, then that's still OK, because you have more algorithms available to you. Um, similar question uh, about speed, but uh, now looking at compression of the data. Like if you have a data in a packet, for example, text column, and you have to run some regular expressions against that, what, what kind of penalty do you see? So I think with the, with the compression, most of that is on disk. So once it reads into memory, uh, it should be similar speed. So like once you read the text into memory or you read the parquet into memory, the, the computations should be similar. Don't quote me on that. I might be completely wrong. But one thing that you do pay for, depending on which compression library, is the time it takes to load the data. So at some point, generally parquet or, or feather or whatever will be faster to load. But at some point, if you're using some really, really intense compression algorithm, I run into this with HDF5. You have different options for compression algorithms. If you use a really, really intense one, it's going to take a long time just to load your data because it has to transform it into the in-memory representation. So there's usually a good median of a compression algorithm that'll give you, uh, you know, save space for you, but then it won't take too long to load. Probably have time for just like one more. Okay. Well, you can talk to me during lunch too. So well, this will be the last one. Um, I also have a question about sparse data. Um, I looked into using the, the Pandas sparse data frame like about a year ago. It seemed, um, it seemed like kind of neglected and not very well documented and it wasn't clear to me the underlying data storage format the way that it is say with like CSR or CSC from, you know, from SciPy where it's like a very standard sort of format. Um, I just, I'm curious what your experiences have been with it and if you plan to rely on it in the future. Um, I feel like if Arrow is the future of Pandas, then it, it seems like it will probably fall even further into neglect because Arrow, I've read the spec for Arrow and it doesn't seem to me like sparse data is part of it. So um, what are your thoughts on how, how good has your experience been and do you plan to continue using it? Sure. So I use the sparse data frames mostly just because I needed to keep the column names of the matrix, uh, and, but basically I had a matrix and then I had my list of columns and I put them together to create the sparse data frame. But I do agree with you, it seems like a very neglected part of pandas, um, and it's still very black box, so you're not sure how it works. And it takes a long time sometimes to do that, but uh, I chose to take that time because I really needed the column names. Um, and with Arrow, I'm not an expert on that too, but I think it's, it's not necessarily 
fully going to replace pandas, but I think it'll change all the way the operations work in Arrow will just be underneath the hood of pandas. So you should still have the overlaying data frame that you have, but maybe the way it computes things within the matrix and the joins and everything would be pushed down to Arrow. So I think we're okay. Again, Wes is the expert on that. You can ask him tomorrow. Um, but I, I agree that the sparse data frame needs a little bit more love. 